Okay, wonderful. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, tremendous. I'm super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, I thought we'd just start off by asking you if you could tell us about your background, your story, and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I currently run a business called Warrior Woman Mode um, on the backs of a brand called Well Power, which is over my shoulder in this video, which is my podcast and fitness and wellness platform. I grew up a dancer. And that's a, a long and winding story just about how I wanted to dance and how my body changed shape. But I think my foray into the world of biohacking and fitness and nutrition, uh, especially female focus, is uh, because there was a, a challenge in the, in the dancing industry around uh, body dysmorphia and the way that women were under eating in order to be able to stay thin or quote unquote fit is what they thought, right, in the ballerina sect of the dance world or any of the dance world and that thankfully has changed a lot today but just being curious about that for the first uh teenage years of my life i started dancing when i was five but just like through my teenage years and then and then when i was 17 16 17 years old i was doing food combining and juicing and super weird for that time i was like a weirdo kid in my performing arts high school i mean it couldn't have been any weirder braces glasses performing arts high school I was a gem, <laughs> but I was having a great time. <laughs> I was a nerd, but I was having a great time. And um, in the midst of all of that, I just got more and more curious around what and uh, what ways I could serve my body and my energy, really like my energy well. And I liked to eat food and I wondered what was uh, sort of the optimal way to do that. And that helped me lean into uh, the next you know, 10 or 20 years of my life, which was blossoming from a teenager into a career and adulthood and being able to do a lot of certifications around fitness training and group fitness and nutrition and yoga and really this big exploration around biohacking sort of before and during the time that Dave Asprey was Dave, Dave Asprey uh, launched the term biohacking, right? Which is like, it's, it's using ancient practices in combination with modern technology and innovation and the whole swath of things in between in order to shift our physiology and shift our body for a like, better, happy, healthier, longer, well-lived life. And in the midst of all that, I've used a lot of tools. I've had a lot of fails, for sure. You know, you go a little overboard sometimes or mm. something doesn't work for you specifically. And I've gotten to the place where I am here now. I do a lot of I'm in the coaching space. I do a lot of work with females, although I do work with men and women because I have a huge passion and propensity around training people how to do breath work and cold exposure in a way that can mm -hmm. change their performance, change their lives, and, and literally transform the people that they are. So it's a big space. It's a big arena for me. I get to play it, and I'm so grateful. Yeah, a lot of a lot. Of, like, I wanted to ask you. You started as a dancer, and I think I heard you on um, the Biohacker ba Biohacker Babes podcast. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned that you didn't go straight into. I mean, you always had this passion for biohacking and, and breath work and, and and these different areas in health. But you went off and you had sort of a corporate career. Yeah, I had a crazy corporate career that was wildly fun and exciting and interesting, and a place where I really found. A high level level of success. There was an innate ability in me, even from like the theater days. I've always recognized I love performing, but I was like less nervous uh, behind stage or directing or organizing, stage managing, and that just came much more naturally to me. And I think that was like something that was recognized. And then I was promoted through the ranks of corporate America at a relatively young age managing not only brands and being creative around brands, but managing teams of people. And so that came so easily into my life. It just sort of showed up one day unexpectedly. And I tried out this first job as a young woman in this, uh, in the, the beverage industry, actually. I played a lot in the, in the realms of alcohol, spirits, and wine for some of the biggest companies mm. in the world, as well as um, what I get a lot of times there's a feather in my cap as I helped launch Red Bull in the United States. And so that was a really interesting, oh, wow. um, fun path, very fun. And at some point you did a good, good job on the launch yeah, there. It I wasn't can see. just me alone. You know what I'm saying? There was a <laughs> village, uh, but really interesting from a marketing standpoint, that brand, it was so different. And 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, what's really beautiful about my corporate job, because sometimes we look at part A of our life or part D of our life or whatever, and then the next part of our life, and we think, why and how did these things even go together remotely? But the mm -hmm. reality is I was traveling all over the world for several years, specifically even in 25 markets in the United States, like hiring and learning about people and, and training them to educate other consumers. And it taught me very easily how to speak on a stage, how to get information translated from the ivory tower of either research or brands or distilleries in some cases, which is a really intricate process to make scotch, for example. And then translating that down to a person who can educate someone on a city level you know, just a, a, a you or me, a, a, an everyday person in a bar. And so whatever that might have been, I was through this huge training cycle and really learned how to run operations in that way. And that wonderfully, thankfully I had that base to build back to me becoming a master trainer for some fitness formats. And now as I travel around and I teach people how to become breath and cold instructors and work with coaches and speak on stages all over the world and that without that experience of some stage time in theater school and some corporate mm. you know how you navigate the corporate arena i wouldn't be able to do it so strongly as i do now and also like how many times have we heard this story right where someone's like i'm in a corporate job and it's not really serving me in the way i want it to anymore uh do i take the leap do i wait you know the money's good or whatever mm. they're saying and then how do we shift into the next level of our of our best selves or our best selves of our passion, whatever it might be. Mm, well, exactly. I think, I think that's, there's so many benefits to having tried as many different industries and as many different role types as possible before you really hone in on what you want to do. Because my time in corporate as well, I mean, I wasn't there for that long. Uh, I think a couple of years I was in sort of corporate selling software in London. Mm -hmm. And it gave me a real insight because before that, I'd only really been, I'd been a personal trainer. I'd gone to university. Um, I'd done nutrition coaching with people. Um, and I was like looking at people who had a corporate job from like the outside. Mm -hmm. And I was like, why can't you just get this? Why can't you just get this fitness stuff? Like, why can't you just shoehorn all of these habits into your day? Like, why don't you have the energy to do this? Yeah. And then when I went and did the corporate job, I was like, oh my God, like my, my mind is so fucked from the day of like sitting at the computer the whole day and Blue like light. getting no stressed from my boss. And and bosses. Like, yeah, just, all of it. It's just, it's just the most like anti-health like thing you can do. And so like without that experience and that, that level of like empathy, I wouldn't be as good at all. I wouldn't have the level of empathy I do as I do for my clients now who are still in those corporate jobs and who love health and they love fitness and they do a credible job, but they're battling against like a rising tide of like their health, uh, just, just different priorities that are coming from different angles. Like we have different priorities or we may have the same priorities, but a le less ability to serve them in the ways we want to. So yeah. like, it seems like you've navigated that move from corporate into the health space really well. Um, and, and you you clearly have like a deeper knowledge and understanding for your clients that you're working with than, than many other coaches who are just coaches and have only been coaches for that amount of time. Yeah. I mean, I work with a lot of women entrepreneurs and I know that, you know, I want to call it a struggle. It's sort of, you know, you put yourself there in entrepreneurship and in corporate America. And I like to believe that some of those things have expanded, right? Standing desks and uh, chill out spaces and company headquarters and, you know, quarantine around the world for three years certainly shifted the, the structure and the way that we work. But in some ways, what I see a lot is that people are working more than ever before because they're in their homes and they start their day in their homes in many cases or a few days a week. They're at home now and they're working and then they're working and there's just really like, until you leave the room and shut the door, it's not like you're leaving an office and you can transition to your nighttime self. People are just working, putting the kids to bed or going to do a few things or eating a meal and then going back to work. And I think it's it's pretty detrimental, you know, and, and in the same way we got some more freedom, potentially in working in home, there's a lot more stress, there's a lot more anxiety, mm -hmm. there's a lot more loneliness, there's a lot more um, sedentary behavior and I don't really love that piece of, of coming out of quarantine not to be a negative Nancy but you know no, no, done, I'm, I'm with you. I think done. it's a, it, 
Yeah, it's it's the grass is always greener, I think. It's like whenever I was working and I had to go to an office, I was like, oh, God, why do I have to go to this office? And now that I'm, like, working at home a lot and I'm working online a lot, I'm like, God, I miss going to the gym or I miss being, like, face-to-face with clients or I miss, like, you know, the banter in the office. So there's always something. It's like it's the mind always wants to look at the other side of the fence yeah. and go, wow, that was amazing over there. Mm-hmm. Um but I mean, you, you've gone for this focus on on women. Why, why have you gone down that route rather than being like men and women, or like what is it about that that space that you think needs to be championed? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. I think we all, to some extent, when you what you choose to do for work, or like my friend Logan Galbrick, Galbrick would say, like what your peak expression is in the world, and you finally find that thing that like lights you up so much you want to get up at six a.m. and do it all day every day. That. When we find that thing, it's it's part of our own healing. And I think I spent a lot of time in my fitness career and my corporate job working around males. That was just a byproduct of me getting into an industry that was very male dominated in the beginning and since has opened up a bit more. And I, I really learned communication styles and alpha energy, if you want to call it that, from the men that I worked with. And some good habits, some bad habits, right? You take You take what you want, you leave the rest, but the the way that I started interacting with women in the corporate arena when women first started coming into that space was a little clunky because I was I had had to course correct myself. I was in the first job in, I was the first one woman out of 18 men in a division and it was like that for a number of years and mm-hmm. I had to sort of relearn what it was like to communicate with some feminine energy and a little more softness. You know, this isn't to bucket anybody and I don't necessarily mean females versus males when I say feminine energy, but I needed to be a little more soft, a little more curious, a little more inquisitive and um, chatty with females as I was working with them. It just worked better, generally speaking. And so there's some of that that was, you know, this this work I get to do with women is, has continued to heal me and in interrelating with females and what we experience on this planet as a reflection of my own femininity. and. Uh, I tend to, you know, still have a lot of that like alpha energy in me and that's that makes me a great coach and it's something I'm always working on. But when it comes to working with women, I just noticed that there was a very big gap. Number one in the research. So we weren't really, re- women in reproductive years uh, until the 80s were sort of banned from the research. And so that's for a number of reasons. The, the number one being that, that we have a hormonal cycle that doesn't function regularly and it's very challenging to ma- manage in the sense of too many variables in the research, right? And that can get a, a paper or a literature or a study or a double blind placebo trial. It can get all those things thrown out. And so um, I'm not saying it was right. I'm saying I understand. <laughs> And now more women are in the research. So that that gave us this baseline of a lot of the things we're doing are things that were working for men. We didn't know if they worked for women or not in the health space. And how are we not attenuating or tuning into our cycle, our, our monthly reproductive cycle, or perhaps life cycle when it comes to perimenopause or menopause years? How are we tuning into that and utilizing it to our advantage as opposed to shaming ourselves around our period, around menopause, whatever, or, or you know, not taking care and, and optimizing and creating efficiencies there. So for me, that was super important to do. And I started playing in that space a bit. And um, yeah, wish I could have played in that space a little bit earlier. It took a few of my male mentors, quite frankly, to, to get me on the understanding and page of how we can cycle nutrition, nutrition, fitness, performance, and other things in our lives negotiation and emotion and partnerships with our, our lovers, how we can do all that in a way that feels uh, innately female, innately in tune with the harmony of our body or our biorhythms. And that's, it's a whole, it's a big new category, right? And that playing in that space mm. is, is fun. And also there are other, you know, let's say tripwires in the world of being a woman that are either societally put on us or we are creating ourselves like any human might have that Mm. need coaching and so for me it's been an interesting place to play because it's intricate and beautiful and our superpower Mm. that we have these extra layers uh, to be able to optimize our well-being so it's been it's super fun and it's it can be a stack of unwinding the past training and societal norms Mm. that we have unwinding dogmas and unwinding 
stuff that people just see as givens. I mean, like, can you give us some examples of what you mean by like the, the hormonal cycles and how women might tap into particular areas of that? I don't know whether that, that for you relates to training times in the month or like, you know, how people like what, what they should expect around energy levels or what, what is that exactly? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure that we're, we're, first of all, let's just put this out there. We're all very bio individual men and women and everything in between, you know, for unexogenous hormones, et cetera. We're all very bio individual and we need to be able to understand that our experiment of our lives and our health is very specific to us. And then when you look at females, and when I'm talking about women or females in this whole episode, whenever I say that, it just means born as a woman, physiological female, genetic makeup and hormonal profile. And so hormonal profile, females can be something that we can lean into as a superpower. Here's an example. We've been for years and years and years and years periodization training, which is actually a term that has nothing to do with our periods, but periodization training in the gym is using specific periods and weeks and months to be able to build muscle or create hypertrophy, which is growing muscle in the body and deload weeks where we're like taking a little bit of a break to let our body recover and, and get stronger, faster, better. Those styles of programming have been built around the male physique. Doesn't mean it won't work for women. It means that it's not optimal for females, especially females that are not on uh, oral contraceptive or hormonal birth control because hormonal birth control is not really letting our cycle be what it naturally is. It's pulsing uh, a false cycle in our bodies and then giving us a placebo sugar pill or depending on what kind of birth control you're using. If it's not hormonal birth control, which is always what I recommend to women, um, but like you do you, cause there's a lot of reasons to be on different birth control. Um, but when it's non hormonal birth control, I typically see the best results in clients. And when you look at the literature, it's more easy to work hand in glove with that because you can optimize quickly and efficiently. Um, so especially with like pro athletes, I think more and more female pro athletes are going off oral contraceptive or hormonal birth control, which is kind mm -hmm. of cool. So periodization has been done for men. There's a, uh, there is a better way to do it for, for women. It is uh, cycling with a cycle that is a natural cycle uh, during reproductive years. And just based on the mm -hmm. dates, like if you want to be real specific, we look at day like five to let's say 15, it's probably seven or eight days, but every woman's cycle is a little bit different length. So I say maybe like five to 15 or something like that. And we can train as our estrogen is increasing, estrogen is anti-catabolic. This is a big sciencey word, which means it's gonna stop muscles from breaking down, help them stick or build if we are training during that week. So I always talk about that as a go hard week for women where we're lifting slow, steady and strong and we are lifting the most and the heaviest weight of the month, um, the, the least amount of rest days, et cetera. So again, bio-individual, but there's, that's an example of how we can be training differently. You know, I always say this thing, like, okay. if it was like okay. males having that, there would be like fins, 15 days yeah. to fabulous muscle program. Like it would, it would already exist. Yeah, yeah. Right, I'm writing that down, that's coming out. <laughs> Um, I, yeah, I know. Well, no, I, I haven't been, I haven't been in corporate America with that experience to get those branding names on point. <laughs> I, I, um, I mean, I, I'd heard there was, there was some level of, of sort of psych, cyclical monthly sort of testosterone rises and fall is, falls and, and different aspects of sort of a male cycle that's going on. But I haven't I only heard that off this cuff. I need to do some more research on that. Well, you but guys have like a it's, daily. It's you have, a da you you have about, more of a daily 24-hour cycle than you do monthly. You know? We have like a morning, a morning rise yeah, you, as oh, well, you have right? have a morning like rise. Morning rise so. and, <laughs> Yeah, oh God. Yeah. Choice words, choice words, choice Listen, words. I, have I, know, I'm, I have to that, say as a male. I have guy friends that are not always like comfortable talking about it, but when they call me with health, you know, questions or issues or like some of the guys I'm working with are athletes. They're like, you know, athletes mm -hmm. in, in training for their like triathlon or whatever. And they're like asking me about health questions and the question comes up and it's like, we need to not, not talk about it. It's like, if you're a man, uh, you're born a man and you have a male appendage and you're waking up in the morning and you don't have at least mm -hmm. a bit of an erection, then, you know, there's something you could be doing to be able to create more health in your body. Like, it's a great sign to have a morning yeah, erection. Sure. And so my guy friends are like, all right, Kristen, next topic. Or my clients are, and I'm not trying yeah, to get, yeah, you know, I'm yeah, not trying yes. to get, 
I know a lot about that part of the male cycle in some ways and things that can bolster and support that. And so sometimes I weave those into podcasts, even though I'm like, warrior woman mode. There are things, you know, that are important yeah, for our yeah. health as, as signs, right? For women, one of them is like, if you are in your reproductive years, getting your period every month in a relatively regular time frame is and should feel like an exciting and wonderful sign that your body is in a healthy state. Mm. You know, same as the direction, gentlemen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bulletin, bulletin, everybody. I'm just going to say that uh, <laughs> 15 times on this podcast, and then they're going to be like, oh, Yeah, I know. It, 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 feel, it, it feels <laughs> difficult. How come this one <laughs> It feels difficult. Downloads? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm just going to cut this out. There's going to be a special excerpt video. It's just going to be erection, 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 and period, 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 period. I think it's more difficult for me to talk about periods as a male rather than erections. Well, I, oh, you know, I ask a lot of times that people have male audiences that are, are relatively big because there's a few tools in, the, in my tool belt that I talk about for, like, the manhood biohacking stack, which is all around that, like, sort of sexual performance and erectile yeah. good morning and... So sometimes I talk about that. You never know. You never know. But for females, Good, female quite right. space, yeah, ladies, never... you got stuff you can do too. But in the female space, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of things people aren't talking about. We're not talking about cycling with our, our yeah. hormones. We're not talking about menopause. It's getting a little bit more popularized now, which is exciting. Um, it's We're not talking about like our periods because they're shame. We're not talking about sex or, you know, satisfaction in the bedroom. Mm. We're not talking about, you know, how we can train better, faster, smarter enough and for me, a lot of that is, you know, mm. if you're a woman, you're listening to this podcast right now in this moment, check in with what your fitness routine is. You need to be lifting heavy weights. Like you have to lift some heavy shit. That's just it. That's it. Whether you like it or you don't like it, if you mm. want to age gracefully, if you want to keep strong, if you want to have core muscles, all of that, yeah. get a strong, big booty, make a peach, all of that. You got to lift heavy mm. muscle, heavy weights. And that is not... I mean, like, 100%. if I see one more woman, I love Instagram, and I hate Instagram, and if I see one more super buff, perfectly put together, matchy-matchy outfit woman on the edge of a weight bench, curling a five-pound dumbbell, I don't even know what I'll do. It's like, that's Honestly. not how that woman got strong and looks like that, not from some five to yeah. pound dumbbell, it's, or yeah. curls, for that matter. Not that that can't make your arms strong. Just, yeah, it's totally... You know. Totally deceptive. It's totally deceptive, like... The amount of the amount of women and, and a lot of people who just see that as like it's a it's a dangerous thing or it's a thing that's going to get them super bulky or that they're, they're there in their their home fitness area doing like with the little five pound dumbbells or two pound dumbbells like lifting for 20 minutes and they're like oh that'll do but like i'm totally with you like heavy weight all the way like not to not to excess you don't have to injure yourself and you don't have to like you know, you just got to be like aiming to put yourself in that strenuous zone of lifting, you know, to the edge of your to the edge of your abilities mm -hmm. and to try and do it well. And it's just it's it's becoming more valued now, I think. Yeah. But it has been so undervalued for so long. It was just like, oh, my God, I don't want to injure myself or that's going to give you bad knees or that's going to give you a bad back. I mean, like sitting like a like a prawn at a desk, <laughs> that's going to give you a bad back. Yeah. And that's it's super true. It's really uh, it's fun to watch that message grow and go out into the world more. And there's lots of reasons why we haven't, you know, why we're more risk averse as women can be all the way built back to some of our brain chemistry or neurochemistry. And that's OK. And being nervous is why you get a coach or a trainer for a little while. If you're nervous about biomechanics, if you're nervous to walk into a gym for the first time because you feel like you've never trained or you're the oldest one there, whatever youngest one there it doesn't matter just mm. how do we get how do i hold our head how do we hold our heads up high and walk into a space and say i'm gonna give this a the old college try and the other thing that i even was just talking with a new client yesterday about this where she was saying i just didn't really understand that i was like putting together a rep scheme or like the way that i lift weights the format how many in a row or how many times etc that i was like doing that to get to to like a failure because I don't want to go in the gym and I don't want to feel like I failed. But like that, for, for, for efficient, effective strength training, for longevity boosting, for the beauty of your body, for recompositioning body fat off, for losing weight, for a lot of things. I hate the term losing weight, losing body fat. That's what you got to do. You have to try to lift to failure. And just perfectly like you said, Finn, it's not about being unsafe or biomechanically in poor form. It is about 
lifting what you can lift safely heavy as hell and getting to a place mm, where you're exactly. like maybe i can't complete that i do my seventh rep and i'm going for eight but i can't quite do the eighth and that's okay because your 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 minimum effective mm. dose of stress on your body you know not to say that a 90 year old yeah. woman wouldn't be like 10 pounds as heavy on some move like it could be it's all relative yeah exactly yeah. it's got to be relative but i also think regardless of your your like stage in the gym whether you're on day one or whether you're on day like a thousand yeah. like i think it's better to work with a coach yeah. like because the, the stuff that you can you can kid yourself into thinking that you're doing well just because you're moving it and just because you've avoided pain for a certain amount of time but there's nothing like having someone there who's gonna say actually no you, you can correct this a bit more or like at this weight your form goes like, cause it's so easy yeah. to just like to have good form up until a certain weight and just to get that little ego pops up and you're like, yeah, I'm going to stick an extra five kilos on and your form just goes shit, which means there's just one little link in the chain missing, but you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily in the best position to know that you're trying to look sideways. You're trying to look in the mirror. You're trying to, you know, you might set up your phone and your camera and like, it's just nothing quite like having an experienced coach there with you. Very, very true. Um, and I think that's what, yeah. And I think that's what, um, like it, it, it's leaving that ego behind. So especially when people start in the gym and start with something new, it's like not expecting that you're going to be good and not expecting that you're going to be good for, you know, some years to come. Like you just have to have that attitude of like wanting to be consistent and wanting to wanting to work and get better. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So so like when you're working with a when you're new, with a new client, what's your um? I mean, obviously it's very individual, but like what's your sort of go-to biohack and what's your sort of like thought process for the first like couple of weeks? Yeah, I mean, I work with women in one of two ways, either in a one-on-one -on -one private coaching program over the course of a year. It's a marathon, not a sprint. So you either work a year with me or you don't. Um, I love you, but I also want people to know that that's a really important thing is committing to consistency. And the other way that women work with me is in a group coaching program. So that's another year long program. It is um, group coaching calls and an online course that I have that's called um, Wow Factor. It's like warrior woman mode online. And that, that was sort of born out of quarantine. So I would have enough videos and content for people to be able to do some things at home. It isn't necessarily like workout videos. There are a few in there, but it is about finding the eight areas of health that we need to work on over the course of a year. And then taking them on one at a time. Because if, if I said to you, here's everything all at once, just like anything else in life, you'd be like, that's too much. I can't adhere. I cannot put all that in, all the newness, all the change, and then just go for it. it it's a lot and it can be confusing. So step by step, we walk through it in the course and I get on calls and I answer any questions and I coach people online and people will send me form videos on their phone or they will say, this is going on my period or this is going on with my gut. Um, but I, I, I always look at the baselines of what the nutrition is and what the fitness variance is first. And if you're asking about biohacks, I'd say the lowest hanging fruit. I talk about mm. breath and I get everybody I work with in the year long one-on-one -on -one program, I get them a, uh, an aura ring. And so some kind of tracker, aura ring or okay. a bio strap is typically what I recommend. So getting a you piece get them of an tech. An aura ring? What, an aura what, ring? An aura, so ring? aura ring looks like this. And that is a uh, okay. tracker, a period tracker, a breath, SPO2, a heart rate variability tracker. Uh, uh, my bath shop is on the ch charger right now in the other room, but that's one that is on your wrist. Okay. It does a very similar thing. Yeah. Uh, you want to get one, not both, because yeah. they they their metrics are slightly different measurements the way they do it. But the bio strap is great and the aura ring okay. is great. And they both do a, a phenomenal job of, around sleep. And that's like really the thing that we didn't yeah. even learn is the baseline for health. So. Managing and understanding your sleep, yeah. managing and understanding your breath, and then, um, and then starting to lean in on the baseline items, which are food and fitness. And 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 just I'll just roll you back. You mentioned eight areas of health. Yeah. Can you list them off for wow, us? Wow. Sure. Let's see how that goes. Uh, breath. Yeah. So, sorry, I put you right it's, on the spot. No, it's totally there. perfect. Like, it's just I probably have to like write them while I do them because I know the the, the order. And and interestingly enough, I'd, breath to me is a very important piece, and so is sleep. But in the online course, I go right yeah. into their intro and then defining their baseline, which is so baseline understanding is where am I right now across the landscape of my health? It's almost like the introductory, who am I? How fit am I? This is not a judgment thing in the sense of like good or bad. It's just like, how many push-ups can I do? 
Do I eat McDonald's or do I eat clean? You know, what are the basics? Do I have lab work I can look at? Am I taking any supplements now? And really understanding where you're starting, right? Because everyone's going to be starting at a very different place. And then we work through, I I work through nutrition first and then fitness. And those aren't necessarily to me as important as sleep and breath, but nobody wants to start a course with something that's like, let's talk about sleep because they get bored. So we get a baseline understanding and then we do fitness and then we do um, nutrition and then we do uh, breath, fitness, nutrition, breath, meditation, cold exposure. There's a little bit about sauna in that. Uh, we talk about red light therapy. We talk about cycling with our cycle. Okay. And then there's a couple bonus modules and, um, in there where I talk about a ton of different biohacking tech and a ton of different other things. But um, yeah, but yeah, yeah, those are the baselines, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot. I mean, there's it would it's very easy when you look at the full picture of health to get overwhelmed and like i think that a huge barometer that i use is what you mentioned there sleep like if generally you can see how you can feel within yourself like how healthy you are depending on how restful your sleep feels when you wake up in the morning because so much revolves around like getting if you get efficient sleep you repair properly and if you repair properly then you you will function better the next day and if you're not getting good sleep there's going to be a reason behind your circadian rhythm your hormone profile like what you're putting into your body like how you're stimulating yourself in the morning are you relying on caffeine to get up and be, yeah. and feel alert yeah. and if your body is naturally able to calm down at night and to sleep properly then it's a real barometer to, to it showing you that it's happy or not That's so right. i think that that sleep item is like a huge barometer but behind whether whether people's like nutrition is right fitness is right. i mean any, loads of these you could start you could almost start like analyzing someone's someone's overall health like you could spend a year on, on sleep these if someone has sleep dysfunction to just get their sleep right you could spend a year easily on nutrition easily on fitness it's just really trying to give people exactly. enough information that they can start to make change because you can only dive mm-hmm. into the level that you are comfortable with a, a bit of, I, I always I talk about it like snackable content. It has to be snackable. If it's like you're trying to eat the whole pie, it just doesn't translate very well. And then recognize like too, I have a, my module that's the biggest one in my online course and the one we end, we obviously talk about the entire year I'm working with people is nutrition. And it's almost in a two a two part series, right? Like I'm massive. I have a meal plan and suggestions and nutrition and different styles of eating. And every when I work one on one with people, it's highly customized. So it depends on if they're training for a, you know, if they're a professional athlete and they're training for something specific contextually, or if they are um, a householder, you know, or a mom who's never worked out her entire life and just turning 60, like it doesn't, everything in between, it doesn't matter. We have to figure out the course of food and how that makes sense. And then part two of that is like supplementation, right? So everyone hates, not everyone, lots of people like supplementation. I hate taking all these pills and getting regimented and getting an order. And Mm. what do I take and why? Or I just read this thing that this dude wrote on, WebMD or some blog and I just got the iodine because they said get the iodine and all of that is like the worst thing you can possibly do. And so part of part two of Mm. nutrition is what I call supplementation mode, which is like once we have nutrition on lockdown, we have some lab work. What do we do with with supplements like that is actually going to benefit us and not break our budget, right? It's a lot of people throwing a lot of money. They call it it's like expensive urine. You took all those supplements you didn't really need. Yeah. So we try to be more prescriptive around that. Yeah, it's yeah, it's 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 difficult the supplement world. I mean, I was speaking to uh, this guy, Dr. Russell Jaffe, the other day, and he's got a um, he's a company called Perk, and that no affiliation here. And mm-hmm. uh, the company is like is is super high end and super um, adamant around their their lab quality. Yeah, because there are so many products out there that just aren't what they say they are. Yeah or are slightly misleading, um, you know, around certainly around like fish oils just being seen as fish oils or omega-3s being as omega-3s. And like we have plenty of omega-6s in the diet from like seed oils and canola oils and, and different types of like vegetable oils. And we're not really getting the actual omega-3s, but they're just being touted in these um, supplements as like fish oils. So I think there's a lot to be desired 
for a lot to be sought in the supplements market. Yeah, and then people are going to start um, buying random brands on Amazon. This is not a slight on Amazon. Of course, it's just, you know, there's something mm. called fairy dusting in the industry and these proprietary blends that are like, you can put one granule of the thing that you say is the helping agent because it's really expensive and the rest of it is either filler or all these other vitamins and that don't support it in a proprietary blend. And that's just like, you're paying all this money and you're getting something that would take eons of time to be able to actually affect your system. And that's like not cool. So I, yeah. I'm very prescriptive about where I, I'm the woman who writes and calls or knows the owners and meticulously their visits their headquarters or talks to customer service for an hour or two a month or like insanely. It's like Thorn, it's like Thorn. I use a lot of their products because their customer service team will stay on the phone with me as long as I have questions for as long as I want. They send me information. They're yeah, I bet they love about you. their about their supplements, and that's really really helpful to me to understand. There's purity and there's quality sourcing, and I also like sometimes mm. I make you know I'm ju- I, I judge based on I think from nutrition standpoint why they're putting something in or leaving something out for the general public because it's a formulation for basically the general public, and some of their stuff is for athletes, but they have to make calls as well. So I'm I'm really prescriptive about where I buy yeah. and how I buy things, and I typically send people to my Instagram bio link and say, look, here's all the brands that I've found to be best experientially and research wise. Doesn't mean there aren't other great brands, but like, I'm sure you see this too. People are like, oh, this one's inexpensive online. And it's like, well, you got on Amazon, you never heard of it before. The review that has three reviews Mm. costs $20 less. Maybe that collagen isn't for you. (laughs) You know? Yeah. Well, I I find like sometimes some of the some of the worst ones are the ones with most reviews because they're cheap and they've just got either a load of people to buy it or they've gamed the reviews somehow. And And it's like, hey, look at this, super cheap. Yeah, and like people see, I think the other one I saw the other day was like vitamin D, super high strength, and I'm a big fan of vitamin vitamin D, super high strength, but it the. They were, they were doing it with soft gel caps and the soft gel caps were bulked with corn oil and canola oil. Yeah. And I was like, that's, you know, you, you're taking this in caps and you, and that's pretty bad for your digestion, digestion and your inflammation. Yeah. And, you know, so, so it's like a double-edged sword. You got like, you're looking at the one thing that gives it that like fairy dust or halo, which is the high vitamin D. And you just, you're not looking at all the other stuff in there. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. But in terms, in, in terms of your own, like, uh, your own health and your own areas, like where you started and your biohacks, like what was your, what was your kind of strength? Like what really pulled you in? Like, was it nutrition or was it fitness? I know you had this dance, this dance history. Um, I think food was the, it was the, it was like the hook. Food was the hook. Cause I was exploring all of these different eating lifestyles. And that really just let me do, let me like win and lose in my own body, just experience different things, you know? trying trying them all and trying these like on trend diets as like time went by and um working and, and listening to people like mark sisson in the early days who's sort of the the father of, of the paleo primal diet and uh just an exquisite human being on the planet trying to make positive mm-hmm. change in the food resource world and in the fitness source in the fitness world just saying hey that we can do this differently and burning fat as fuel is a lot of his um, taking the research and summarizing it for us all. Gundry came before him, was doing a little bit of that. And, you know, there's some great people on the shoulders I get to stand on that I've learned from, but that gave me some insight to being the weird girl as well. Like going to my corporate job in the early days and being that girl that was like doing things differently or putting butter in her coffee when Dave, when Dave came around and mm-hmm. being like, you're going to die. And so, yeah, playing in that arena with OMAD, like one meal a day and liquid diets and, vegetarianism and just you know whatever i could get my hands on Mm. and so figuring that out and layering that in was cool and then along came with us a lot of tech heads as you know or you know men in the tech world coming in into play with the biohacking industry or people like ben greenfield who was sort of like really experimenting at a higher risk level for someone who's like triathlon training and endurance athlete training and how he put those two things together and Ben is a you know a family man and doing all those things that he's doing now and that's great. But in his younger years, he was a bit more. Uh, he's still kind of a risk taker, right? But he was like, red light on your balls and cryotherapy and injecting peptides and all this <laughs> early. And you know, women look at that differently. And part of the reason I use the term biohacking, which is polarizing, and a lot of people don't like the term, 
I use it often because I'm trying to continue to get women to feel like that's an approachable term that they can do. And so I, I tried lots of the things in the early days. You know, I, I got a lot more understanding and the ability to speak on stages about red light therapy and cold and breath and all of that by really leaning in hard to those categories in the last, you know, in the recovery in the last five or six years. But I've been using tools like that for a very long time, you know. I think there's I think there's uh, there's levels of biohacking as well. Like some levels getting super complicated, and then if you just roll it back to what it is simply, like it's just understanding your biology and trying to work with your biology. I mean, yeah. it's as simple as like when it gets dark at night, not having too many lights on, allowing your natural like hormones to kick in to make you sleepy. Totally. Like that's a biohack. Like taking drinking a cup of coffee to to get you through some work or to get you through like something you need to be stimulated for like that's a biohack you're just working with the the like tools in your body and it gets it gets cast into this super like woo woo magical like world where it's like and there is a, is a certain amount of like complexity once it gets to the higher levels like the red light therapy and like some of the uh tropic tropic hormone supplementation um so, I mean, yeah, what's just, your, what you do know, you think has made the, the biggest thing. impact? This is the thing with biohacking, too, though, is it's yeah. not, we could say, you know, it's hashtag biohacking. Just look at it on Instagram. There's shit on there that's like, here's my new dress, biohacking. I just, the next, pod, <laughs> the next podcast episode I'm launching is called Biohacking BDSM. Yeah. And it, it is about trauma adjustment mm. and trauma, recovering for, from trauma using BDSM, which is a bit more of like a, you know, a, a lifestyle choice but working with coaches yeah. in that arena because it's happening. That's interesting to me, right? And so is it fully biohacking? Maybe because it's like hacking trauma recovery without talk therapy and using something else. So there's this really wide swath yeah. where people start to say biohacking is everything. And I don't think it is everything. I think it's like when we try to level up from yeah. where we are to something that's more effective and efficient. And so that's why it, it yeah. feels like everything is because for someone, they're like, I'm gonna have a cup of black coffee at McDonald's. It's like, I'm always gonna chair at McDonald's. And that's great. Yeah, and they, hashtag buy then they realize like maybe that there's mold in that and they're gonna go and get a better, more expensive, potentially coffee and they make it home and they are now biohacking their shitty coffee habit they used to have and actually making it better and more efficient and effective. Then the next person is gonna go, Awesome, I'm gonna take my coffee and I'm gonna make it super mold free and single origin and organic and I'm going to layer in L-theanine and I'm going, which is like gonna give a slight nootropic effect, like energy and not the crash. And I'll make it bulletproof with grass fed butter and coconut oil, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it's like all these different levels we can layer in at nauseum. And for some people that's cool. Like they wanna, I'm a super nerd when it comes to my biohacking my coffee. And right now I don't even do caffeine, I'm like, biohacking my decaf coffee to get it to taste good wow. and to give me wow coffee. when did you come off caffeine is that, is that a new thing you're off caffeine i've been off caffeine for better part of four months i probably have had four cups of coffee that have caffeine in them in the sense of uh i'm either traveling or someone's like brought me one graciously for an event or mm. something and i'm like all right it's not caffeinated nothing else is available i can choose to not have it but I, i'm not i don't have how, an allergy how are you feeling with that uh, it's kind of cool. I've been doing, uh, I've been hold, I'm like holding in my hand, funnily, funnily enough, one of the Newtopia um, nootropics that I will take. Uh, I've been bl mixing it with different things. So I'm still having caffeinated, sorry, decaf coffee, or I'm having, some mm. mornings I will have a little bit of um, a cacao tea, which is a minute steeping. And there's a little bit of, there's a tiny, tiny bit of caffeine, like a light tea yeah. in there. Um, but not much, and I'm bulletproofing it some mornings, and then not others, and then having it with nootropics or microdosing, mm. and I've been playing with a, a bunch of different stacks just to see what makes me feel good. But I will say this: for me, the issue on switching to decaf, the biggest issue is taste. I want it to taste like a robust, mm. black, amazing caffeine. Oh, no, I'm with you. There's just something about the Swiss water process of decaffeination or something that is. I haven't really quite found like a dark yeah. roast decaf that makes me feel like yes, but I'm, I'm like you're drinking real coffee. I'm getting close, and well, I'm not drinking coffee because yeah. my cortisol numbers were like pretty nuts, so and my hormones have been getting a little wacky. So I made that choice, and that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Mm. I I mean I've it's something I've been dwelling on for the last like ten years of like coming off caffeine. I think that like to my shame, I think there's probably a week 
not a week consecutively, but seven days total in the last 10 years when I haven't had a cup of coffee, at least one cup of coffee. Like, and, you know, like, I, I did, and on those days, like, I had headaches. I had headaches, like, I was low energy, like, my body play. is so That's reliant on caffeine. With, like, the how do I titrate this down and not have an addiction to it. And yeah. also, caffeine has been vilified yeah. for years, and a moderate amount of caffeine has benefits. Brain chemistry, neurochemistry. Mm. 100%. Oh. I'm, so, yeah. so, yeah, I think it's just, like, um, the 400 ounces of coffee a day drinker or someone who's drinking a lot of you know, just say crappy coffee, right? It's like test your mold, test your, your toxicity level. Some of that might show up there. You know, there's other things. Yeah. But I like, you know, I like yeah. 100%. Person. So if anyone's listening to this and knows a robust flavored decaf coffee, no one will have an answer. No one does that. No one does that. <laughs> Get, in do. Get in Not touch. Get in touch. Tell me, someone. Gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hear the listening figures. That everyone's gonna log off as soon as you say that. <laughs> you know, right? Don't talk to this woman. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's for my cortisol I mean, I, response. I don't. I think everyone can have yeah. caffeine. It's great. It's just in my lab work, my cortisol was, mm. was spiked pretty high, so I, I decided to take six months off. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. I'm. Uh, I'm. I, I want to do it. I just every day I kick the can down the road. I'm like, nah, I'll do it tomorrow. Like I wake up. It's a real joy in the morning. It like that first joy, cup of coffee. Yeah. Like, and uh, not to rub it in, but like that first heavily caffeinated cup of coffee in the morning. <laughs> For me, it's like it's more Just about like, the ritual. Yeah. I think that's what I missed. And so I still yeah. have a ritual of making something hard and whatever. Anyway, yeah. it's like backwards yeah. biohacking in 100%. my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one thing I wanted to pull you up on, I, you, you mentioned biohacking BDSM. Like, <laughs> how do we get to that? <laughs> So I interviewed this really wonderful dominatrix named Mistress Natalie, and she has a program called Kinky Coaching. And she works, I'd say, with 80% males and 20% is females or couples, and really uh, getting people to explore their kink, right? So that may be something as simple as being spanked or a visual kink, right? Like not even necessarily sexual in the, the word touching, but something that turns them on. Um, people with fetishes, so if they've had, in many cases, this I don't know if this will sound weird or not, but in many cases they will, if someone has an experience with like a, a hospital that's scary or an experience somehow in their life that's trauma, they want to sort of recreate that in a way that is, um, it could be a number of things, right? Either kinkified or cartoonified or made lighter or made much more dominant and submissive, et cetera, mm. and so that they feel like there's some control in the space. So someone holding a container who, by the way, is a professional and has a background in working with people in these sorts of traumas, or they have not, um, it, perhaps it's a person who has like been holding back on something that is their kink that they're really into, like sexually or physically or just viscerally looking and seeing something that they can't share with their partner, or maybe they ha haven't come out about it, if you will, right? It doesn't mean necessarily gay, straight, mm -hmm. LBGTQ, whatever. It just means they haven't come out about it because they're in a 25-year marriage and they want to be tied up, but they're afraid to ask. And so she'll work with couples in that mm -hmm. realm to try to get some comfort there. And uh, she'll work with people who are trying to process through like challenging hospital issues that they had, etc., by um, kinkifying it, you know? And that's uh it's an interesting space to play in and it's like you know i think there can be some, super interesting yeah there can be some fun there of course right and keeping it a little bit like not taking mm. ourselves too seriously that we're like i like a ball gag or whatever i don't know you know i like to be spanked whatever it might be <laughs> it's okay right there's a yeah. lot of shame in that area and the, the reason that builds back to me to biohacking or mental health is because holding and carrying a lot of shame in our bodies at a cell cellular level can make us sick you know, and so how do we explore yeah. all the things we want to explore and understand there are plenty of communities and, and, you know, sometimes people will, I, I wonder if people will listen to the episode and say, hmm, it launches next week. Um, I wonder if people will listen to the episode and say, <laughs> wow, that's like some of what she talked about is way far out there. But, um, like my friend yeah. Alexa always reminds me, she's works also in like a sex coaching kind of industry. She's like, hey, you think that this thing that's totally taboo and crazy and out there is like all the way on the other side of the road, but you're like sitting on the sofa and actually that thing is like right there next to you. Like you don't know until you've really thought yeah. about it or maybe explored it or tried it or maybe it's not as weird, quote unquote, as you might think. And so just 
You don't yeah. ever have to do any of those things that other people are doing, but isn't it nice to just be open-minded enough to say, well, that person feels better by doing that. And that's, you know, that's something I wanted to talk about in that mm. landscape. I know it's like a crazy title, but it's like, you know, it's the work that she does as a dominatrix and a kinky coach, and she's been doing it for 25 years. So I really trusted that putting her on the podcast would feel uh, not overly sensationalized and also as a super... It's a super fun yeah. conversation, and I think I, I'm like I say the I say like butt plug like three times, and every time I say it, I'm like hi mom, <laughs> hi mom, how you doing? Yeah, butt plug, butt plug, butt plug. <laughs> so like yeah, I just, <laughs> there's something there's something around. There's that, a topic that. that comes up. This I don't know what you're going to call this podcast. It's going to be like erection, erections, butt plugs. Um, it's but these are it's things, changing as we I speak. Know. Listen, I. I <laughs> Biohacking has always been a lot around fitness and nutrition and how we can optimize and technology and elite supplementation and there's always been talked about. But there are lots of things that we are holding on to when it comes to the shame space that we can shift, right? It's why I facilitate sometimes cold and breath in the plant medicine space. I work in a lot of different mm -hmm. arenas because what I've noticed over the years of coaching is that if we wake up in the morning every morning and we look in the mirror and we speak to ourselves in a negative way and we talk shit about our bodies or ourselves or ourself, that we take that in. We are listening. We are listening in every moment. So, you know, how do we get up and take a positive tone to the day and without spiritually bypassing stuff we need to talk about? And that's important, right? Mm -hmm. And that may be through an outlier style thing this is what biohacking was always about it's like what are the outlying places to play and for some people that's like red light therapy they're like what is this like a red light bulb panel that hangs on my wall and why can't i just buy a dollar a dollar 99 light bulb on amazon that's red and what how does that work and how does that make me recover or fire my mitochondria in my cells that might be like totally cutting edge and for other people who have had a red light panel for two years or more they're like well what's next what's what else is out there that i can continue mm. to to get back closer to the person I was always meant to be, right? Because I believe all of us have this beautiful capacity inside of us. And we've spent years maybe layering, instead of like unpeeling the onion to find out the inside, but we're layering shit on top of ourselves. We're like saying, hey, what, you know, here's a construct. I'm not good enough. I don't feel worth. I'm not as strong as that other person at the gym. I don't have willpower to eat something that's healthy, whatever. It's like, how do we shift mm -hmm. those? How do we like move those gently to the side and really, you know, come back to our own, come back to the best people that we were, that we can be. And, and that is to me what it's all about. Right. And, and doesn't have to be red light therapy. Could be, doesn't have to be, you know, getting on a chilling mattress to keep your body temperature cooler because you're sleeping poorly. But you know, if you're sleeping poorly, let's find some solutions for you. This is why it's so individual fan, right? It's like, it could be sex, yeah. it could be sleep, it could be skin, mm. it could be food, it could be so much. And there's, this is a, yeah. a beautiful journey, right? If you listen to Andrew Huberman, we talk, he talks a lot about what the dopamine journey is, that we all think, when I get to the end, I'll be so excited. And the dopamine actually <laughs> comes, the joy comes, like as lame as this sounds from everyone says the joy is in the journey, the joy comes on the path to getting the you know, the, the end game, the win, the goal the thing. or the thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's a, it's a, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about the process and that's what trying to get people to enjoy is about. I mean, nothing should be off limits really, like in terms of like p the pursuit of either optimal health or optimal wellness or optimal mental, mental health. So like, yeah. I don't know. It's, 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 uh, I think it's either Kelly Starrett, Starrett um yeah. or another guy who was like how did we move before we learned to move like when it was just a natural thing and like how did we think before we learned to think in a certain way like before we learned to think in a way where we're taking orders all the time or yeah. we're like we're not taking initiative or where we're, we're thinking of being like submissive to someone else or we have power over someone else like how did we think just when we were natural like and that's what's difficult to get at like maybe we're maybe we're all meant to be in these hierarchies of society like i don't know jordan peterson always talks about like the the hierarchy system or the serotonin system of the lobster 
like even a lobster has the same i know it's a terrible analogy yeah. even a lobster has the same like serotonin system that we have that that gives you that hierarchy in society that lets you know whether it gives you that feeling of wellness depending on how you feel in relation to others yeah so like maybe that's built in like what what is an uphill battle and what what should we not be fighting against that's that's the difficult thing to to decide yeah, and i think giving ourselves a little bit of grace which we suck at and then specifically with females if we're talking about women's physiology like we are more susceptible to anxiety to sleeplessness to stress uh, different parts of our life for sure but just like even in the monthly cycle we have times when we are more intuitive and that is neurochemically the the, the reality and we have times when we're more sensitive we're more insular uh you know all of that is is real and so how we function and how we respond to certain situations like a global pandemic can end us up after two years of that it's like little micro stressors every day maybe burnt out and tired and anxious and all of that is not our best selves and even in that hierarchy of serotonin feeling like shit like that is not there's more and so that's the other thing you know coming yeah. off of this pandemic i feel really fortunate because i um i found tools and i forced ways of force is like a word I try not to use but I like allowed tools to enter my life really I tried to I probably forced some things in my life outdoor gym and a new job and some things um, like a new program that I was working in because I, I needed to fulfill my extroversion in a time that no one was seeing each other and at that point I was living alone and so many people are right now are in the space of mental un, un you know it's like they're unwell mentally and that is I got to tell you, I talk to people all day long for a living. Like this is about their deepest, darkest things. And this is not uncommon. Nobody is, should feel alone right now. Like there's better days are coming and there are tools that we can use and, and they can be as simple as breath work or, you know, a morning cup of coffee or whatever to create joys in our life that can open us up. But getting in community is super important and talking or finding a way to process, let's say, maybe it's not talking, but finding a way to process the emotion or a physical response. Like how many of us were in the house? I, I, I ice bath all the time. And I got, I had an ice bath on my roof and I was like, I'm kind of afraid when I lived in California in the beginning of the pandemic. And I thought, I didn't like cognitively think this, but this is what was happening. I was like, oh, I'm like under wraps and watching news. And like, I don't want to go on the roof deck with a helicopter. <laughs> it's my roof deck. Like why I didn't so go up there so for like two <laughs> months? I didn't ice plunge. Like I was like, yeah. it's not okay because COVID, you know, whatever. And it's it's not mm. you know it's not mm. realistic. It's just your body has this response against trauma or like you know excited activity or whatever it might be. And and you're like, ma, yeah, this is an unprecedented thing in yeah. our society. And so there are so many tools that yeah. respond that help our nervous system respond and feel safe, and we've forgotten how to use them. And maybe we didn't use them as much well, before, they, well, but we need to now. Yeah. Or maybe they were just maybe they were just natural, like in our daily habits. Like, I mean, I was talking again. Dr. Russell Jaffe talks about like harmonizing your pineal gland just by being in the green, like being in the green of a forest. Totally. Like, and the, but I've what fought, happened like, to a lot of us during the pandemic? We got stuck inside for extra, extra, extra hours, and now even I'm like, what am I doing yeah. inside? I can be on the porch. I can be on the lawn doing this, like work or yeah. editing or whatever and it's like amazing to see people doing that again and getting out and we need to yeah. be doing it more like for reforesting ourselves you know yeah yeah 100 percent. you I know because you're in mexico it's not, it's, so you got a good reforestation <laughs> potential there. i'm living the dream I'm living the dream. You to be are. honest, I look outside my door. Although all my window, all my windows are closed at the moment because it's it's noisy here. That's oh, yeah. the one thing. Like I live in a noisy place. Yeah. Like noise pollution 101. Like 3 a.m. I've got some guy tearing past <sighs> in like a really loud motorbike, and then like mariachi music blaring <laughs> all over the place. And like you just just got to become accustomed to like it's just loud yeah. here. Yeah. So like I don't know. I sleep with earplugs now, um, like pretty much all the time, yeah. but. Yeah, I think I think the pandemic gave gave people the chance to like 
either breathe for like some people the lucky chance to breathe from going into the office every day and then reassess like what they really want their health to be like and to actually be aware of their health like because sometimes you just weren't aware of your health like you just go into the office you drink your coffee you drink your tea you have a bit of cake in the afternoon and then you go home Mm -hmm. and you've just played with your insulin and caffeine levels throughout the whole day and then you're you're tired at night and like you haven't really taken into account any of your your natural flows or your natural daily rhythms yeah um this is why i think it's it's kind of because we can do it with breath yeah centering ourselves and like getting Mm. ourselves healthier you know yeah yeah and 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 that actually leads us on to like pardon i said play with all the fun toys do all the things right get in the ice which is like a big thing i love and let's if we can breathe better we can calm our state and we can be more focused or at least clear in the midst of everything else in our life yeah a hundred percent and that leads us on to i was going to ask you i got some police in the background Welcome oh it's to so Mexico. funny i thought it was here i was like looking I'm out like... the window yeah <laughs> yeah well maybe i'm just gonna let these guys i'm gonna let these guys roll past i'm gonna hear a knock on my door in a minute the episode <laughs> where you get arrested wow <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We've got BDSM. <laughs> we've got me being arrested. We've got erections. This is we've got periods. We've got it all. Amazing. We've, we've got, got periods. We've got, we've got, got strife and strain yeah. and, and wins from women. It's you know all the things. <laughs> we've got everything. Um, but to, to just to wrap it all up, I was wondering, and I asked you a little bit before, is like what is the one simple thing that a person can do to add to their morning routine or any part of their day to feel more energized? I mean, the one simple thing I always will say is breath. It's just the tuning in. So if you want to be real prescriptive about it, um, and you know, I would say breath and cold together. Everyone has access for the most part, although it's harder when you're in a warmer climate to a cold shower. But the, the, the first thing we can do is get up and give ourselves, sort of serve ourselves, whether our coffee's brewing or whatever's happening with like five to 10 minutes of really, um, good breath work and that you know good breath work can mean a lot of different things if you're waking up and you're feeling stressed about the day you're going into then you want to down regulate your nervous system right so just 2x breathing whatever you breathe in for doesn't have to be overdone or time just breathe in for a count of four to yourself exhale for a count of eight um nasal breathing is what i prefer in the morning most days i imagine and and it can really serve us well to calm our state and to get the body a bit healthier by using the nose to breathe versus the mouth. It doesn't mean we shouldn't breathe through the mouth. It just means there's specific good times for that. And if you're waking up tired and groggy and sluggish, then maybe there's some super ventilated breathing you can do with like big forceful inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth, like you're you're blowing out candles on a cake. No one does that anymore post COVID, but just, you know, and doing some cycles of like 15, 20 of those breaths and then just taking a moment, maybe doing some small submaximal breath holds again safely and just like getting your system to be excited for the day. And, and by excited, I do mean like your nervous system, waking it up and getting it ready to go. It all depends on where you show up in the morning, right? So nasal breathing most of the day is awesome. And then really just focusing and honing in on your breath and tuning in with your body, how you're feeling, your emotions, and then breathing a bit in a way that feels good and then noticing where your body and your state is and then you go off into your day. So breath for sure if you have access to a cold shower or even better, a cold tub, but um, a cold shower is really mm-hmm. nice, you know, and it doesn't have to be scary and it could be contrast if you need it to be, but end on cold, so you'll feel energized. It's a really solid mood booster. It gives you a little bit of brain chemistry that will make you feel positive and ready to ready to go and, and lean into your day and when i first heard about cold showers i was like N- i'm not doing that <laughs> and then you do it and, and you're amazed that it works and you get kind of like addicted yeah. in a healthy sense to it yeah yeah no i love it i mean i i unfortunately here in mexico and in puerto vallarta like it's super hot and humid the whole time so even the pipes that are running underground like to get here warm, warm. Yeah. like all warm ish i mean it's like it's like 17 or 18 degrees you have a like, so in it, that's as cold as it gets for me only. don't have a don't have a bathtub no shower only yeah so i was actually thinking about buying one of those like a big bin and then filling it full of ice on like one day and just being like once a week i'm gonna have an ice bath like sitting in a little bin yeah yeah but uh i haven't 
I haven't plucked up the courage to do that yet. But when I was in England, like I used to do them the whole time, and they change your life. They like yeah. get you up, they get you no, alert, right. you're ready for the so day. So good for longevity, so good for hormonal re-regulation, so good for so much. It's amazing. <laughs> Um, anyway, Kristen, thank you so much for taking the time today. If anyone listening out there wants to find out more about you or, or see you online, like where can they find you? The easiest place to find me is at, uh, on Instagram because that has sort of the portal tentacles to everything that I do. Instagram is Warrior Woman Mode. I have a podcast that's called The Wellpower Podcast. It talks a lot about biohacks and things like that, women's health. And then uh, SherpaBreathAndCold.com is a website that is all about breath and cold exposure i run an instructor training i've been um getting booked this whole year i launched it this year getting booked to travel around and uh austin and then toronto next and so it's really cool if you want to get take your coaching to the next level or your practice i have like massage therapists i have lots of people coming to take it to be able to like serve and heal people in the world with breath and cold exposure so that's like a weekend long course it's super fun i do in person we get to see each other Mm, amazing yeah um, Kristen thank you so much again and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the uh, biohacking BDSM episode <laughs> after an hour what does he take from it typical typical home. yeah there we go <laughs> um, yeah, you I, can see what's stuck in the it's mind it's out there it's out there thank you so much for having me it's so wonderful to be connected and see your shining face and, and thanks for all the work you do and all the education you're putting out it's great that's a pleasure, that's a pleasure. Thank you so much and we'll speak again soon.